We're going to get to Matthew chapter 1, but hold on before you get there. The Magi. You know, I believe the story actually gets started. Daniel, book of Daniel, chapter 4. Daniel chapter 3, of course, is uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Chapter 4, the book of Daniel, is uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Oh, I misspoke. Pardon me. I meant Daniel uh, chapter uh, 6, please. Pardon me. Daniel chapter 6. Oh, Steve will get it right here in just a second. Daniel chapter 6, pardon me. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel 3 is uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel chapter 5, there's Belshazzar. He's Nebuchadnezzar's knucklehead grandson. And he is mocking the God who created the heavens and the universe. And God's got a word for him. And then you get to Daniel chapter 6. Here is the entire major Vegas of its day, the great city of Babylon, walls 300 feet high. Not getting in here. Well, King Cyrus surely did. And when he gets there, he leaves in charge a fellow by the name of Ugbaru. And Ugbaru is likely the character we're going to see here in verse 1. That's who Darius is. But here's the point. Nebuchadnezzar was a Babylonian. He was a Chaldean guy. The Medo-Persian Empire was prophesied specifically through Daniel by the Lord. This is not a surprise to God. And Cyrus, who is a Persian, we would say today, uh, he's from the area of Iran. But he's a Persian fellow, and they coalesced with a bunch of people called the Medes and made quite a formidable empire. Well, that's now who is in control of the mighty city of Babylon, chapter 6, verse 1. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom, Darius is a Medo-Persian, to set over the kingdom 127 satraps. Uh, that word uh, goes back to basically governors, to be over the whole kingdom. You're going to pick up a couple generations after Darius. You're going to pick up in the book of Esther. That scene opens up with this whole, re, this whole realm and region. Over 120 sort of um, regional governances. And so we're a couple generations in front of Esther. But back to the story. Verse 2. And over these three governors of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might give an account to them. So there's three guys over all of these 120. Verse 3, And this Daniel distinguished himself above those governors, satraps, because of an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. How high did Daniel raise to in the administration of Nebuchadnezzar? He was basically, what, almost second in command. He's in retirement, is rickety old Daniel. He's in his 90s, potentially, maybe a little bit later. He just wants to go retire, and he is, he is uh, taken out of retirement by uh, Ugbaru or Darius. Hey, we heard that you're pretty sharp. Now, he is a Jewish fella, and the Medo-Persians don't like the Jews. Verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could, not, they, could not, they could find no charge or fault because he is faithful. Nor was there any error found in him. So these men said, we shall not find any charge against Daniel because, you know, he's got the Joseph defense rolling. What's that? When your enemy wants to take you down, <laughs> but he can't find a place to really get at you because you're trying to walk with God. That's their dilemma. How they're going to get him is by his love of Jehovah God. The story goes on, of course, that um, that's how they do. And they get Ugbaru, Darius, to pass the silly law. If there's anybody worshiping anybody other than you, then they get thrown in the lion's den. Daniel immediately goes home and throws open his doors. I mean, if you want to watch it, you can. He continues to pray three times a day towards Jerusalem. Aha, they say. And they busted him, you know. So then um, Darius, uh, the people who had hoodwinked him into signing that ridiculous edict, 
You can't go against the written law because they believed in a, in a constitutional monarchy. But he was mad, first of all, that they duped him by his own vanity. And then he says, I'm stuck, Daniel, but I'm going to pray that your God rescues you. And so that's what happens. So he goes to the next day, and they put him in, and then uh, Darius can't sleep all night. And then he comes out, and he says, Daniel, has your God saved you? And from the bottom, Daniel says, real quiet for a minute. No, just kidding, king. I'm fine, I'm fine. So they pull him out of there. Well, maybe the lions, you know, weren't hungry. Well, then they throw these other guys in, and the Bible says before they hit the bottom, they were devoured. So they, they, they were hungry, all right. Now, you look down here. Um, let's see, let's see. Well, the decree of Darius. Well, Verse 28, and so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus of Persia. I guess the verse I was looking for was in verse 3, that he distinguished himself. And in another location, um, these guys are called the Magi. It's the beginning of Magi Straits, Magistrate. Um, it took a peculiar sort of occultic term, did some of these, and then it became Magician, and so when we say magi or magician, we conjure a notion of a guy at a birthday party pulling a rabbit out of a hat, kind of trivial. But the magi themselves, I believe, what happens here is Darius promotes Daniel to something called Raj Magi, the number one magi, magistrate, administrator, of all of the land after this whole situation in Daniel chapter 6. I believe that, of course, Daniel, who wrote Daniel chapter 9, uh, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem is going to happen, then start counting, you know, 173,880 days until Messiah is rejected. That is all within Daniel's lifetime and his teaching. What happens is, Cyrus is going to let the people of uh, Israel go home, and many of them do return. But a large proponent of Jewish people stay in Babylon, and they're there for the next several hundred years. There are two really important Talmuds, or the collection of, of the sayings and the teachings of the rabbi. There's the Jerusalem Talmud, and you would imagine. You know what the other great Talmud is? The Babylonian Talmud. And there are over a million Jews that stay in the region and prosper for the next several centuries. It is my estimation that the Magi that are going to be in the gospel story are descended intellectually from Daniel. All right. That in the background, let's go to Matthew 1. <coughs> Matthew chapter 1. And let's read the story of the Magi. Matthew chapter 1, let's start with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, uh, that is to say before they consummated the marriage, you've heard us talk about this before, the betrothal was much more binding than I'm a fiancé to so-and-so today. The betrothal was actually a, a fulfilling of a contract that both parents had agreed to often years before. It's not quite full-on marriage yet, but it's practically everything but. But nonetheless, it was not customary to, of course, consummate because you're not married yet. So this is Mary's condition. Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they had come together, and she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine explaining that one to your fiancé? I'm sorry, What? Well, see, the Holy Spirit has filled me to such a place that I am conceived in a non-biological sort of fashion. Joseph evidently was kind of, a, he was a nice guy, and he knew that he wasn't his child. So no matter what yarn she's saying, I don't think Joseph is buying it. At the time, could you, could you blame the poor kid? Verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, 
Uh, the Bible had instances of what you could do if your betrothed became pregnant. In other words, before marriage. And some of them were pretty rough. And so Joseph didn't want to subject Mary to that. So he was going to put her away secretly. Write her a certificate of divorce. Verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. Joseph is a direct descendant of King David. Through Solomon, interestingly enough. How do you know that? It's in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogies. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name, oh, let's say his beautiful name, Jesus. Uh, if you didn't know, Jesus means, it means Jehovah is salvation. Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, says Matthew. Remember, his surname is Levi. He's from a priestly family. He knows about his Old Testament. Where did Jesus sort of catch up with him to start his ministry? He was a tax collector. He was a partier. Uh, Matthew, you know that you weren't made for this. Leave your tax booth and come and follow me. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord through the prophet, saying, this is Isaiah 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall be with child. Isaiah wrote 700 years in front. And bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. Who is Jesus, everybody? He is God who zipped up a human suit. Verse 24, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took to him, took to him, and took to him his wife. So at first he wasn't believing it, but God knew, Joseph, I don't blame you, so I'm going to send you an angel, probably Gabriel. Gabriel is a presence angel. He's often dispatched from the presence of the Lord. And typically, Gabriel's message has much to do with Messiah. So that's probably what happens here. Thank you, Lord, that you, you give us whatever it is that we need to fulfill your purpose through us. Verse 25, and he did not know her, didn't consummate the marriage, uh, until she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Now chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that's in the southern part of the region, named after the tribe of Judah, by the way, you know that you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. One of the tribes was named after Judah. When they get into the promised land under Joshua, then the Lord prompts Joshua to divide all of Israel according to these tribes. And so the county or the region of Judea is the, is the, uh, the land given to the tribe of Judah. Judea in the days of Herod the king. This Herod is a terrible guy. Herod at this time um, is about his 73rd year. When he died, he was so diseased that his intestines literally burst open with worms. Ew. Sorry about that, Rick. I know you're of a delicate constitution. But he was an awful guy, awful guy. In the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Here's your magi. We know they're from the east, and we can't say definitively that they are from Babylon, but... I got a case to make for you tonight that I think they were. The Greek word here is magi, magi, where we'll get our word magistrate, which means head of state. Remember, Daniel in chapter 6 is promoted to rab magi, chief of the magi. In Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he was over 120 of the other inferior sort of magi. They're hereditary, remember Medes and Persians, right? By the time you get to Darius, they're hereditary Median from the Medes. The Medes had a strong priesthood. 
had been disrupted at that point. That's why the plot was then to destroy Daniel. We're supposed to be in charge, not this Jewish guy, rickety old Daniel. We're the one, we're the magi that should be in charge. But then here he is getting promoted to rab magi, hence the lion's den. The main Persian and Chaldean, Chaldeans are the Babylonians, The Persian Babylonian religion is based on, a lot of it is, interpretation of dreams. Remember, that's how Daniel kind of gets noticed by the king. Nebuchadnezzar has a horrible, horrible dream. It shook him up. He inherited his magi from his father, Naboplazer, great names, and he didn't trust them. I've had a terrible unsettling dream. And they all kind of coddle up next to him. We'll tell us what it was, great king, and we'll tell you what it means. And Daniel, or uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes, nah, if you are worth your two cents and what I'm paying you, you'll tell me what I dreamed and what it meant. Oh, by the way, if you cannot, off with your head. We're going to kill you and anybody who looks like you, and we're going to burn your house down, and you might call that a... Uh, an executive incentive program. Well, they're freaking out. And that's when they find Daniel, who was in sort of a training at the time. He had been deported at that first siege of Jerusalem in 606 BC. He's a young guy at the time, but he loved God. And Daniel said, uh, you know, let me take a crack at it because I serve a God who knows all things. And sure enough, God reveals to Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was and what it meant. And that was that polymetallic being. Well, evidently, that was big business, big medicine for the the Chaldeans. And that's one of the reasons why he was promoted so high. Well, the Median priesthood comes in and dreams are real important to them too. And uh, Daniel, in another chapter, he's going to, in chapter 7, explain another dream. And again, he is promoted. So skilled, well, these Persians and Babylonians, uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars, especially the wandering stars, the planets, they believe all had predictive properties to it, not too unlike the zodiac of today. So skilled were many of these magistrates, magistrates that they even adopted, uh, were adopted by Roman leaders who come rolling in, you know, about 100 or so B.C. And much later, these Latinized priests were then called magi or magicians. Some real quick background. This is for the tape. You will not be quizzed on this, but are you ready for some history? Look out. Uh, some of us are breaking out in hives already, I can tell. Let's go back a little bit. The Babylonians are the tough guy on the block. Daniel already prophesied they're going to last until the Medo-Persians take them over. And then the Medo-Persians, especially going to be the Persians, then the next one after that are going to be the Greeks. And then after the Greeks are going to come the Romans. Daniel has already laid it all out. Well, back to 300 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar was 600 B.C. Medo-Persians, we'll call it 500 to 400 B.C. And now 300 B.C., here comes the Greeks. And Alexander the Great conquers the whole region. 166 B.C., the Jews are going to throw off the last of the Greek overlords. And we talked about that a while ago. That's your Hanukkah. Terrible Antiochus IV throws through Jerusalem and he is mad from his stinging defeat, uh, the Ptolemy kings in Egypt, and he is wanting to take out some frustration. There were Jewish people who were called Hellenistic Jews. They really loved the Greek culture. They wore the tennis shoes and, you know, they ate the burgers and all that kind of stuff. And then there were uh, very staunch Jews who wanted nothing to do with the Greek sort of influence. Well, Antiochus is really hard on those guys. He kills a bunch of them. And remember what he does in 167 B.C.? He paints the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem with pig's blood. And he offers a pig on the brazen altar outside. And then he puts a statue of Jupiter, pardon me, Zeus, Zeus in the Holy of Holies. Is is that a bad day? 
Well, that stupid old abomination that causes desolation, that's a model because the Antichrist is going to do the same. Only it won't be a statue of Zeus, it'll be a statue of himself. God never jumps out from behind the, the prophetic bush and says, boo, he never does that. There are plenty of models, even dress rehearsals. Well, Alexander the Great was, pardon me, Antiochus IV was one of those. 167 is when he does the old abomination of desolation. And then there's a groundswell, a guerrilla warfare, really, that comes up. And then finally the Jews kick out the last of the Greeks. And then they get to the temple and they're going to rededicate it. And if you know the story, they want to light the seven-branch lampstand of the menorah. But there's only enough fuel for one day. How long does it take to, take to, to, to manufacture Levitically consecrated oil? About eight days. Should we light it? Let's light it. At least we'll have the, the, the flames for one day. Well, day number two, it still burns. Day number three, four, five, six, seven... And then on the eighth day, it was still burning. And that's when they replenished it with the refurbished oil. It's a miracle. And it's still celebrated today as Hanukkah, the festival of lights. By the way, it's also called the, the Feast of the Winter Dedication. And if you read your Gospels, Jesus attended Hanukkah services in Jerusalem. There are people that give us grief, you know, about our Christmas trees. You know, that's a peg in this and a peg in that. I say, well, maybe in some cultures, but when we put up a Christmas tree and put those beautiful lights, you know what it reminds me of? I am the light of the world. By the way, you know what God says to, the, to those that are saved? Um, all things are lawful. Not all things are profitable. You know, I can get drunk and I won't lose my salvation? No. But is it a good idea to get drunk? And to the pure, all things are pure. Anyway, I bring that up that the Hanukkah celebration, Jesus observed. It's not in the Bible. It's not a feast of Moses. It is a cultural embracing of something unique to their history. And God was okay with that. Well, anyway, back to about 166 B.C., that's when the Jews, 165 actually, will throw off the last of their Greek overlords with the Maccabee boys. Well, the Persians, sort of east of them, they also are going to throw off their Greek occupiers under the Persian party known as Parthians. The Roman general Pompey, He's going to come through and conquer Judea about 63 B.C. But he had lost his bid to conquer the Parthian Empire east, formerly the Persian, and he, formerly the Persians, and he is defeated in a battle called the Battle of Karar, 55 B.C. So, well, there was a guy by the name of Antipater, and he was an Idumean. He was half Jew, but he was a political climber. He jumps in. He helps Mark Antony push the Parthians farther east, reestablishing the Roman rule in Judea. Well, well done there, Mr. Antipater. And Rome is so grateful that they give Antipater governorship over the region. And about 50 B.C., Antipater appoints his son, Herod, the quote-unquote, <coughs> the great. He was an awful, awful guy. He had a bunch of wives. He killed some of them. He had a bunch of sons, and he killed a lot of them, too. It was said it would be uh, safer if you were one of um, Herod's horses than if you were one of his sons. Well, anyway... 50 B.C. is when Herod, thanks dad, gives, his dad gives him the car keys to Judea. Two years later, Herod is forced out of Judea by a guy named Antigonus. He's a full, full Jewish people with the help of the Parthians. Herod runs back to Rome and returns with Roman legions. Antigonus is defeated 40 B.C. Herod is restored as king. Yay! And 38 years later, 
Around 2 BC, Herod is in the last year of his miserable life. Let me read you a quote from a history book. Emperor Augustus was, so, was also aged, and since the retirement of Tiberius, Rome was without any experienced military commander. Pro Parthian Armenia was gathering a revolt against Rome. The time was ripe for another Parthian invasion of this buffer province, Judea. It was at this time that the Persian Magi, remember the Persian and Parthian are almost the same thing, the Persian Magi in their dual priestly and governmental office composed the upper house of the council of the magistrates or magistrates whose duties included the absolute choice and election of a king over their realm. It was these group of Persian Parthian king makers who entered Jerusalem in the last year of the reign of Herod. That's the history. Is, um, is Herod a little twitchy about the Parthians? In the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, Greek magi from the east, came to Jerusalem saying, where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. Now remember, that's going to make Herod really twitchy. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. A couple of verses you might want to write down. Psalm 147, verse 4. I'll read it to you. He, the Lord, counts the number of stars, and he calls them all by name. Also write Isaiah 40, verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out there the stars, brings out their host by number, and he calls all of them by name. Not one is missing. Hold your finger here. Go back to the book of Psalms. God named all the stars. Look at something that King David says that's quite peculiar. Psalm 19, please. I, wonder, I was going to read it to you, but I'd like you to see it in your Bible. Psalm 19, verse 1. A psalm of David written a thousand years before Jesus was born. The heavens declare. That Hebrew word means to enumerate. The heavens are saying something. They declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Now about those stars, verse 2, day unto day they utter speech, and night unto night they reveal knowledge. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How are the stars speaking? Paul says that the Jews knew the Messiah was coming because of the stars. Check it out, Romans chapter 10, right around verse 18. The Jews had a suspicion because some of them were watching the stars. Now, you've heard me say it before, but what that means is the, the sun travels across the sky, and that approximate pathway is called the ecliptic. Did you know that the moon and all of the planets are on that same plane, if you will? They're closer or farther between, but all of the planets in our solar system are on the same line and lineage as our moon and all the other stars. And so when you watch the sun move across the ecliptic, if you will, flatten this out for a minute, and then with your mind's eye, here's the sun and all the stars are rolling around it like a record player. When you look across that, now we'll put it back up in the sky again, because remember, planet Earth is tilted on its axis 23 to 3rd degrees. There's all the stars moving across the ecliptic. There are 12 constellations that make up one month of the year. One month every year, the sun and or moon is in one of those constellations. And you know that the, the devil sort of went with that and ran, and he makes astrology out of it. 
But you need to know that before it was called astrology by the Babylonians for occultic purposes, did you know that the Jews were very much in love with many of the stars? Why? Because God says, I made them. And the 12 constellations of the ecliptic, if you know the names of the stars contained within, they tell a story. What? One more time. Chapter 19, verse 1. The heavens enumerate. They don't just talk about the glory of the Lord in sort of a generic sense. They literally are, if you will, chapter and verse. They enumerate the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day, these stars, they utter speech. And night unto night, they reveal knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And their line, RSV version, says their words have gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Back to Matthew it's a funny thing that, that in almost every culture of the world, the stars have mostly the same and similar names. Let me show what we're talking about. Uh, in, the, in the astrology thing, I think it's Aries that starts the loop. But the Jewish Maseroth starts with Virgo. Virgo is another way of saying virgin. And if you know all the names of the stars, then it tells a, an interesting story, just like Psalm 19. What's next? Well, Libra, the scales. And if you've ever looked up into the heavens and say, I don't, that doesn't make the shape of a scale or a bull or a lion or a crab. I don't get it. And their name because of the stars contained. So the virgin starts the story. The virgin, and then in the sta the the uh, the scales, the primary star, if I remember, Zubin al Ganubi, and it means price deficient. That's what it means, the star name, is offset by Zubin al Akrab, a price paid. And as you march through the 12 constellations, you're going to end up with uh, one that's called Concir, and you have to unravel some of the more older names for it, but it has to do with God's people in a pickle. And the crab is looking at the virgin because it's the cycle is going to start all over again. But the crab can't get to the virgin because there's a star constellation in the way. The constellation of Leo, the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah is one of the monikers of the Messiah. You're going to have to get through me. And if you know uh, Revelation chapter 12, there's the story. Well, back to this idea about the stars. Psalm, one, Psalm 19 is saying that the, star, the stars are saying something every night. Um, also, uh, I should have had you right there, Numbers 24, verse 17. I see him, says Moses. I see him, capital H, Messiah, but not now. I behold him, capital H, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter. What's a scepter? It's a signet of royalty. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And there's a bunch of others. Here's the point. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. It would seem that Daniel was very versed in all of this literature. It would also seem that the intellectual descendants, the magi by name, these very well could be intellectual descendants of Daniel himself. If so, do they have their copy of the book of Daniel with them? Yes. Do they have Daniel chapter 9 with them? Yes. When the decree goes to rebuild Jerusalem, start counting. Well, that's already happened. That was Artaxerxes Longimanus. And they're knowing that they are getting almost to the very end because that 69th week, 
ticks off the 173,880th day when Messiah is rejected. So look a little in front of that and you should find the rough lifespan of a human living on the planet. Were these magi watching? Now watch what might be something that's worth noting. If you didn't know it, uh, Aristotle and Ptolemy, about 100 AD, the cosmology was, everybody knows, that all of the universe is rotating around the earth. Because from the surface of the earth, Sure looks like that. And you're going to have to wait to the 1500s and you're going to get something called the heliocentric theory. Copernicus was not the first, but he's one of the ones who proved it mathematically. No, 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 the earth is not the center of the, even the solar system. The sun is. And what did Copernicus get for his trouble? <laughs> he got persecuted. Then you're going to get to the 1600s, Johannes Kepler and laws of planetary motion. He's a tremendous mathematician. And then late 1600s, you're going to get to Sir Isaac Newton. And his mathematical brain was absolutely astounding. And he wrote down many of the laws of gravity and his models of cosmology and how Jupiter pulls on Saturn and the sun pulls on everybody. And he is practically correct to several uh, percentage points. Now we know that the sun is the center of the, of the solar system. Did you know that you can get on your um, iPad or your phone a little something called um, Starry Night? I recommend it. It's free if you want. You can download it and you can look up. I wonder what that star is. You get your phone out and you point right at it and it'll tell you. Did you know that in the early fall of 2 BC, you dial your Starry Night program back? Did you know that in Leo... Every tribe of Israel had their champion, their mascot, if you will, consolation. Judah, guess what their champion, their mascot, their consolation was? Leo. And that would make sense because Messiah is going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Leo is largely regarded as looking like a lion. Um, there are four brightest heavenly bodies in order are the sun, obviously. Next brightest would be the moon. Next brightest is Venus. In fact, uh, if you go out tonight, it's probably set by now, but uh, if you go soon after sunset, Venus is low on the horizon to the southwest. It looks like somebody's headlight coming right at you. That's the planet Venus. Number four is the next brightest is going to be Jupiter. Right now, Jupiter is up and to the left if you want to look at it. That's your fourth. And you get down, down to about number nine or ten. Then you're getting into the magnitudes of stars now. And one of the brightest stars in the heavenly north hemisphere is Regulus. From the word regal means king. It's one of the brightest stars in the northern hemisphere. Guess what constellation it's in? Leo. It's the brightest one. And in 2 B.C., something quite peculiar happened. Hasn't happened since. The God star, Jupiter, the God star, what are you talking about? Yeah, uh, who's the number one honcho in the Roman pantheon is Jupiter. The Babylonian god Marduk. He's the main God star. Well, the king star is Regulus. And because they're all sort of on the same plane of the ecliptic, in 2 BC, Jupiter is going to swing right past Regulus. So close that to the naked eye, you cannot tell them apart. That would have been hugely bright. And that's not all. Here comes Venus. Venus and Jupiter were so close to Regulus that it looked like one massive bright light. And it hasn't happened since. Would that have been something that would have caught the eye of somebody watching the stars? I think so. Not just any conjunction, triple conjunction, but in the constellation of what? Leo. 
Not only does Jupiter, the god star, the Babylonian god Marduk and the primary Roman god, um, but then Venus, the virgin star, <clears throat> swings by all three and they can join. In Leo, Judah would have been a spectacular bright superstar. Now, about this star, was it a comet? I don't think so. Real quickly, for you scientifically minded, nine characteristics of this star. It wasn't a comet. Number one, it signified a birth. And as I said, early fall of 2 BC, Venus, mom, Jupiter, dad, conjoined with Regulus. Just saying. Number two, it signified kingship. It was in the constellation of Leo. To the Jews, that's big medicine. Number three, it had a connection with the Jewish nation. Number four, it rose in the east like the other stars did. Five, it appeared at a precise time. Six, Herod didn't know when it did appear. In other words, this was something that was not terribly out of the ordinary. It wasn't like a comet. When there's a comet out there, people will come and check it out. Number seven, it endured over some period of time, almost a year actually. So it's not a comet. Eight, it was ahead of the Magi as they went south from Jerusalem. Uh, because if you stand there in Jerusalem and you look south, there's Bethlehem. By the way, in 2 BC, if you didn't know, if you, if, you, if you go out each night and here's your field of stars and then they never move one against the other. But the stars that do move, those are planets. So one night your, your star um, Jupiter is here. And the next night at the same time, it's here. Next night, same time, it's here. All stars make a progression across the ecliptic. And because of how orbits work from Earth, they will march, 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 stop, go up, back, and then continue on. And that little circle maneuver is called a retrograde. And relative to the surface of the earth, all planets appear to do just that. So does Jupiter. In 2 BC, Jupiter is in full retrograde. Not only did the three swing by and join, Jupiter stopped. Venus kept on marching. Jupiter stopped and circled Regulus. It takes several months for that to happen. So you can think about it. When Jesus was born was 2 BC, and it was probably in the fall, not December the 25th. And there's some reasons for that, but probably in the fall. He was, uh, shepherds are watching their field by night. You wouldn't do that in the winter time. So there they are in the fall. It's conceivable that when the shepherds are seeing the angels go see the baby in swaddling clothes, above their heads was this triple conjunction. 900 miles to the east are there devotees of Daniel watching the very same thing? They get together their caravan. It would have probably taken conservatively four-ish months to move the 900 miles. They would have arrived around December. And in December, Jupiter was in full retrograde, frozen night to night. And if you're standing in Jerusalem, looking south to Bethlehem, it would appear to be standing over Bethlehem. The Jewish historian living in Alexandria, Egypt, a guy by the name of Philo, was 20 B.C. to about 50 A.D. He writes that the Magi in the east, specifically, were Babylonian. And they were brilliant observers of the sun, moon, and stars. Were these Magi the intellectual descendants of Daniel? I wonder. The huge population of Jews that stayed in Babylon may lead, lead, lead that to, be, to have some credibility. Did they also know about Daniel 9's prophecy? The time is ripe. We've been counting the days since Cyrus's decree. And we are probably now within the lifetime of when Messiah should show up. We'll watch the stars. And then that triple conjunction is happening about the time of Jesus' birth. They pack up potentially their caravan 
four-ish months, and now it's December, mid to late. Verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and so was all of Jerusalem. Oh, no, not another Roman Parthian war. Oh, no. That's why all the people were freaking out. Verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ, Messiah, would be born. So they, the Magi, said to him, or pardon me, his um, his Jewish leaders, pardon me, said to him, well, that's an easy one. In Bethlehem, write Micah 5, verse 2. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Who is Micah speaking of? Messiah. How come Herod didn't know that? Probably because he was not a, a devotee of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what really cracks me up is that these religious Jewish leaders who did know, why didn't they see the conjunction right above their heads? Verse 6, pardon me, verse 7 then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time those perhaps four, five months ago, maybe longer, appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. Now notice, it's going to say it several times, not baby in a manger. This is a young child. Jesus could now potentially have been five, maybe six months along. Who knows? But he's a young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me. You go find him and you tell me where he is, that I may come and worship him also. And I wrote in the margin, yeah, right. Verse 9, and when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Still it came, until it came and stood over where the young child was. Was this Jupiter in full retrograde? Maybe. Was it a bona fide, straight up, supernatural ball of light in the sky? Is God capable of such a thing? Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Is Jupiter in full retrograde? Then from Jerusalem, looking south to Bethlehem, it would have stood right over Bethlehem. You can spin back your starry night program and actually call up that date. Verse 9. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Verse 10, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, notice it's not a manger. Uh, Joseph and Mary have moved now from the manger where Jesus was born, and he's a young child now. So now they go to the house. When they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshipped him. And they, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts of gold for a king frankincense for a priest, and myrrh, which is a burial spice, prophet. He's prophet, priest, and king. For you um, prophecy buffs, write in your margin here, Isaiah 60, verse 6. Did you know that in the millennial reign, kings will come from the east again? In the millennial reign. And they're going to bring gold and frankincense and no myrrh. Why? Jesus dies how many times? Just once. A Jewish religious leader, they missed the star, the glaring sign. And I wrote in the margin, oh, I pray that I don't miss God's signs either. You know, a big one was 1948. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother. Flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and they departed for Egypt. And there they were until the death of Herod, which was not much long later, months really. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord 
through the prophet saying, out of Egypt I call my son. Matthew is connecting the history of Christ and, or I should say to, the history of Israel on purpose. Israel was driven to Egypt, right? And then they were called out, uh, the Passover lamb. Then Israel goes into the wilderness to be tested for 40 years. Hosea 11 verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Guess whose other son of God is coming up out of Egypt? Matthew connecting the history of Jesus and the history of Israel is a subtle yet huge concept because Israel's God's son and Jesus shares Israel's history. He's God's son too. We're going to only get down to about uh, verse number 23, so let's finish up. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, the Magi, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem. And in all its districts, not just Bethlehem proper, but all of the districts, from two years old and under. That gives you another clue that Jesus is not that old. He could have been close to a year perhaps, but my hunch is probably six, seven months. And Herod, for good measure, didn't want to miss him. So his order was to kill the babies two years old and under. According to the time which he determined from the wise men. Verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice is heard in Ramah, a lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Um, Rachel, remember where she died. She was pregnant with Benjamin, if you know the story. And she gave birth at Beth. Bethlehem, and then she died there. Benjamin, what tribe, that's the 12th tribe, what tract of land did the Benjamites get? Right next to Judah. The voice of, was heard in Ramah, that is in this region, lamentations, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, the Benjamites, and Bethlehem is in the tribal region of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is in the tribal region of Benjamin, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. God knew about what Herod would do. One of the 300 prophecies concerning Jesus. Verse 19, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, Egypt saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother. Go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. Then he rose, took the young child to his mother and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Verse 22. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea, Archelaus is one of the knucklehead sons of Herod. He's going to lose his job here in a little while, but until then, he's the honcho. He's connected to Herod, so he can't live there. So instead his father, instead of his father Herod, and he was afraid, Joseph was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside to the region of Galilee in the north. And he came to dwell in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of by the prophets, that he, capital H, Messiah, shall be called a Nazarene. The Hebrew word is natsir, and it means branch. Right in your margin here, Jeremiah 33, verse 15. In those days, the last days, at that time, I will cause to grow up a David, a branch of righteousness. One of the, one of the Messiah's titles is the branch. Zechariah 6, verse 12. Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Nazir, a Nazarene, fulfilling all of these prophets. So that's why he's from Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. Cool story, huh? Let's all stand together. Thank you, Lord, for your history. Lord, I want to thank you that with a, a Wikipedia and a good historical a Bible history book, we can piece these 
places together. We can't say for sure that the Magi were from Babylon and potentially directly descended intellectually from Daniel. It seems to make a lot of sense. What's fascinating to me about this story, Lord, is these guys were watching like a hawk. They saw it. And then they traveled 900 miles as a result. Herod and the religious leaders there in Jerusalem didn't catch a thing. And they wouldn't even get up and go five miles. Lord, before I cluck my tongue at those hard-hearted, if you will, church-going believers, they were in church, as it were, every Sabbath. They were religious like crazy. But practically it would seem no one in the Harvard town of Jerusalem. They were so busy with their stuff, I don't know why, they didn't look up. They missed a powerful sign. Lord, I don't want to be one of those. So caught up in the politics of the day, to mask or not to mask, uh, inoculation or not inoculation, and all of the stuff going on. The progressives are taking over. Those all have their place of concern, but for the people of God, we should be looking up. And seeing your signs, Lord. I want to be one of those. I don't want to miss a drop, Lord, of what you're doing. And if I'm one of those, now what am I going to do about it? What am I willing to take my time away from? I mean, recreation is important. A vocation is is an important part of life. But Lord, what am I taking seriously in your word? What am I doing? Where am I going? How am I altering my own life to learn about the signs of the times today in which we live? And who am I telling about it, Lord? And what treasure am I willing to part with because he is king? Lord, I pray we at Harvest are sensitive to your prophecies, that we are students of your word. And that we tell everybody and go tell it on a mountain. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen, amen. Well, there's your Magi story. Hey, we'll see you on Friday night, you guys, hopefully with your snow tires. <laughs>